the, our section on structure and gate by a wonderful quote from Steve Field, who is not uh, a man to mince words. Kali does not run on its own page. And uh, beyond that, dogs are very physical animals. They're totally centered in their body, and their whole well-being is centered in the body. And if there's a physical lack of balance in the dog anywhere, the dog is not going to be its best. They cannot mind over matter the way humans can. The feature that makes a collie be a beautiful animal in the show ring also makes him a sound, agile, graceful, and functional dog at work. Without a doubt, the serious breeder must ascribe due importance to structure. Proper balance cannot be obtained with disregard for any part of the anatomy. Balance is the key word. And balance is the key word in all study of the breed, in all aspects of the breed. And as you went through each different section of this seminar, you should see that it is one puzzle that needs to be put together so that it all goes together. First, in order to consider the Kali in movement, one must study and evaluate the entire conformation. Without the proper balance of its part, the Kali will not move freely and correctly. The set of the neck and head carriage are quite as important as the set of the tail and its carriage. We're going to start to look at the Kali this morning inside out. You need to know what the uh, foundation and framework are before we move on to what's on the outside that you can see. This is our um, skeleton diagram of a generic dog. It is not correct. As a matter of fact, could it, could it walk? No. <laughs> it Probably. couldn't run either. However, uh, if you're going to study the dog's body, you need to know what the parts are. That's why that's in here. You need, uh, we may use some um, colloquial terms. We're going to use the word shoulder blade for scapula. And we're going to use the word upper arm for humerus and various other colloquial terms. But you need to know what the, the parts are. All study of the college should start with the standards. The written standard and the illustrated standard. The written standard describes structure in sort of two parameters. One is what are the elements that make a functional animal of this general shape? Uh, it talks about the dog having uh, a fair amount of bone and good spring of rib, a chest that goes to the elbow. <coughs> Any number of breeds would have that same description. You, you could be talking about a golden retriever or a pointer or a weimaraner. It's not distinctively Connolly. When you get into the other part of the paragraph, though, which is the standard second objective, it tells you things that are very specifically Connolly. And in that, that paragraph on body, the slight arch over the loin is very distinctively common. So the uh, illustrated standard by Lorraine Still is a hugely valuable tool for studying structure. And if you use the two standards together, the uh, written standard makes more sense in the context of the illustrated standard. This is the first of the diagrams we're going to talk about today, which is the skeleton. And there's an awful lot we can learn about the dog and the proportions of the body by looking at the skeleton first. <coughs> Let's start up here. The neck, which is long and slightly arched, is actually no longer than the back. And by the back, she's not talking about from... Uh, yeah, well, this is another this terminology. When I say back, I'm talking about this little space between the top of the, of the shoulder blade and the end of the ribcage. That's the back. This whole assembly has got three parts. This is the back, the loin, and the croup. But the, the back itself, if the neck is any longer than the back, the dog is going to top heavy, and it will bother your, your eye won't like it. It will be asymmetrical. I can't say that. Asymmetrical. asymmetrical. The loin is no more than one third of this whole area, the back and the loin together. <coughs> the loin is too long. It doesn't have a, a it, the rib cage ends here, so the bone 
it's not a bone structure that comes all the way underneath the loin, it's weaker. And so it can't, it's a cantilever, and it can't maintain strength over much distance. I find that I would be able to uh, accept a little more length of, of, of loin in a fish than I will in a dog. It's just more pleasing, it's feminine looking. And that's where the puppies live when they're carrying them. See what else uh, there are, you hear the word angulation bandy around all the time. There's certain measurements that need to be um, in, in certain proportions on a dog for the body to work properly. So the, the, we're going to do four measurements from the point, top of the wither to the point of shoulder, down this center line of the shoulder blade is one, from the point of shoulder to the elbow, from the ischium or buttock to the stifle, and from the stifle to the palm. Those four angulations, two, two bones front and two bones rear, have to have a proportion on this diagram with this dog, those four measurements are the same. On this dog, the width of the dog across the front of the chest is also the same as the length of the shoulder blade. These are things that are, are your eye will feel this as, a, as, as being balanced. Those four angulations enable the dog to move with this front and rear strides the same length. It means that the legs are the correct length in, in proportion to each other. The, uh, the uh, collie is slightly longer than it is tall. That measurement is taken from the point of shoulder to here, the buttocks, the point of the issue. Can I notice it looks like it's going uphill, but you're still doing that measurement. And the height is measured from the top of the withers to the ground. On this, on this dog, the uh, proportion, the height is about 90% of the weight. And uh, I'm sorry, height is 90% of the length. <clears throat> and the way that that's broken down is again, it's not like the back, it's not like the line. A lot of the, the depth of the dog is this whole rear assembly here. If that's where your uh, drive is. And so the bones and muscling in the rear, and the fact that they, these bones bend, this angulation, actually is part of the dog's length. Yes? Could you go over again what you were uh, saying about the, the um, point of the, of the butt <coughs> to... Okay, the, you measure this uh, from the point of the issue to the stifle. Okay. Stifle to hock okay. is the other... These are the bones that, di that dictate the reach of the dog. How far, how big a stride is going to be. Is that, is that? correct the way it's drawn to my eye it almost looks like if you picked up that leg and put the hock up to that issue it's longer than it should be yeah it's you know it's funny but the first time i ever measured this diagram i actually used a set of engineering dividers mm -hmm. it's not to build illusion is it, is it that's yeah. what i wonder yeah you know? it looks a lot of people say oh the dog is longer from stifle hock than he is from issue mm -hmm. of stifle and I thought it was. When I first went on, I, my husband's an engineer, so I took a pair of dividers. Mm -hmm. And actually, on this same diagram, I did it. And then I did it on a dog. Mm -hmm. And in both cases, I thought that, that that's, this measurement here was longer. It's not. Can you point out? Because what they're looking at is they're measuring the bone. You're measuring bone to bone. Well, no, I was the illusion. On the top of that, it's still, from here, to me it still looks longer. From point to point. So the it looks longer. I agree. But it isn't. Uh, the let, me, uh, let me show you on this one. Here's the, uh, here's the same thing. Just take your fingers and go here to, uh, uh, I'm sorry, here to here and here to here. I'm not moving that finger, it's the same. Yeah, okay. It's an optical illusion. Each one of you have a copy of this diagram in your folder. Right, and if you take that out. Take, your, take it out and put your fingers on it. The copy we've given you is a little small. Or take the edge of your pen and measure with that. You've got paper there, mark your paper. 
Yeah. Make yourself, you can make a little ruler. A little ruler. All right, let's move on here for a moment. This is the uh, skeleton from the front and rear. You notice that the dog is approximately the same width in the front and in the back. Now, there are breeds that are not the same. The you know, bulldog, for example, is, is big across the front, narrow in, in the hip. Uh, the Sharpe is wider in the hip than it is in the front. Here you can see that the, our tail is, uh, the bone part of the tail comes all the way down, to, even with the hock. Tails are important, they're, they're um, rudders and counterweights. So they need the full length of it. And they should be substantial. It shouldn't be like a retriever. It should be substantial for the size of the collie. One of the things you can notice better on this version of the skeleton than on the side view the way it's drawn is that the front assembly does not have a bone-to-bone -bone connection to the rest of the dog. It's a soft tissue connection. And therefore, you can have a front, whole front assembly or front piece that is correct in bone length, but it's placed usually too far forward on the dog. And the uh, range of motion is, is restricted. This, the neck is restricted. And the ability to talk, the dog to quickly turn one way or the other is restricted. OK, what you need to do now is you are the dog. Take your shoulders. This is the dog's shoulder. They want you to pull them all the way back. That dog has to do that. Okay, stick your neck forward. Is that comfortable for you? Pull your head back. Can you feel where that changes, what you feel here? Now pull your shoulders all the way forward. Imagine a collie taking a jump, absorbing the shock. Take your elbows, put an ace bandage on them. What's going to happen? Pull those shoulders back now with the elbows not being able to bend. Anything you change out of proportion in this collie is going to be felt somewhere else down the line. Okay, this is a very important little little area. This is called the prosternum or, pro, or forechest is the farther forthest. I'm you're gonna tell I just done this three times. Farther <coughs> farthest forward part portion of the rib cage, and actually here is the two upper arms on each side, and the prosternum is in front of. That it's called the forechest. It's in front of the dog, and it's in feeling for this is one of the things you're going to do when you're evaluating the placement of the front piece. And so I have put this up here so you can see what this one looks like. So just imagine what's going to feel like <coughs> of, of the, the line of uh, bumps that you're feeling. Like. Notice that the joints here we have toes, pasterns, wrists shoulder are lined up one on top of the other. As the dog moves, the force is transmitted up through this series of joints. And, and it dissipates gradually so that there, um, this is a, a whole shock absorption system that travels up the line of the dog. And you want that to be in the, each piece in its proper place and the alignment has to be correct for it to work properly so that this is a herding dog who should come down on that foot millions of times in, in its lifetime with no impact on the structure. It shouldn't be damaged or shocked in any way. If you see a dog or anybody move with a stiff, you know, put your arm, stiff arm down and you can feel the, the jolt. It goes all the way up the arm. All right, now flex the muscles. You feel nothing if you actually flex these joints. The, the force dissipates as it travels up the arm, which is, for those of you that remember the old railroad tracks that you would take and you would put them together, one into the other, if you had one that didn't fit quite right, you could hear the train come around and it wasn't that smooth whooshing noise that you got. Or it might even stop, or it might get derailed. It's the same principle. If it's all connected the way Candy is telling you to about, it's going to transfer straight up it with fluid motion, effortless. A couple of other little details here. The um, collie feet are very distinctive to the breed. Uh, they're very small for the size of the dog. The uh, toes are arched, and the foot is very close together. This is a uh, uh, living traction. Pasterns are 
Uh, flexible, but not very long. Much more efficient as, as kind of a nice short uh, pass. Now we come to muscles. The muscle diagram from the Illustrated Standard. I like this diagram a lot. You can learn a lot from it. Uh, one of the things Lorraine still never did with the uh, Illustrated Standard was do the smooth. There are no finished art, art of the smooth in the in Standard, but this series of drawings comes pretty close to what we would expect the smooth to look like. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of things we can learn from it. Um, I like to draw imaginary lines on the dog as a teaching thing. If you start at the ears, and draw a line to the ground. Notice that that uh, line is well in front of the dog. Okay. So the, the correct head carriage here has the um, head out in front of the dog, which is a natural way for a dog to stand in a balanced way where the head is actually kind of, is, is itself a kind of way. This line is drawn through the withers just to the ground. And notice that the withers and the elbows are right above the, each other. This is a really good, easy, quick way to evaluate lay back shoulder. Is the front placed where it should be? The front needs to be under the dog because 60% of the dog's weight is the heaviest part of the dog right here. And so it, by putting the uh, legs under the dog rather than out in front of it, if the legs were under the ears, then it would not be carrying the weight as efficiently. So when you're looking at it, <coughs> here's your collie in the sleigh, the head should be here. When you see a collie and the head is here, something is not right. Can I ask a question? Yes, sir. Um, if on the, the skeletal diagram, could, could you go back to that and show us how the, um, I, I forgot what the bone is, but how it would, the bones would look, or they would move if a dog was straight in shoulder, what they say, straight in shoulder? Oh, sure. <clears throat> straight in shoulder, if, there are several ways a dog could be straight in shoulder, but the most common in collies is short of arm. Even though I don't really want to talk a lot about faults today, because I want you guys to build a picture of what a correct collie is. Well, I would think one of the things that's difficult about studying structure is the, uh, the books or the videos, they give you a little tiny bit of right and then spend 80% of their time detailing all things that go wrong with the assembly. And I find that I get lost and the right gets lost. But I will explain this because it's common in the group. This frame, having this bone here be too short is real common in collies. If, it, if it's too short, and especially if the whole front assembly is placed a little bit, even if it isn't, instead of having this angle go back like that, it comes straight down here like that. Okay. Therefore, the whole leg, now, the, sh the, the shoulder blade's in the same place, but the leg is out closer to the front. The leg is farther forward here. I get it. It's more, it, it. more or less. Now, the whole front assembly can be located forward, so it's here. So a lot of dogs that you see with, whose necks look short, they're not short. All dogs have the same number of neck vertebrae, seven vertebrae in the neck. So the, the, and, and in a breed, most of the dogs of a size of, in a, most of the collies that are 24 inches tall are gonna have neck vertebrae that are about the same size. There can be fractions of, of inches different, but the front placement can be for, further forward, which makes the shoulder angle then becomes different and it blocks part of the neck. So those are two ways that can happen. This, is this uh, short upper arm thing is very, very common in the breed. Okay, thank you. And you we'll know? show you later on how to measure that. Yeah, so where was it? <coughs> uh, okay, uh, notice the uh, arch of neck here. That's what the standard calls for, it's a slight arch. This line um, also, imagine a clock face where this is 12 o'clock. You see that the collie at rest then uh, Holds it head, its head at about 11 o'clock. That's the natural, what we should like to see. Candy, <coughs> yeah. Candy, would that dog uh, in the ring look like it was turtling or pushing its head out? Or would it look? No, no. No, because it's at 11 o'clock. If, if a dog is, because Pat and I have dogs in the same family, and they all look the goose. 
mm. reach out for they that. They call them turtles. Yeah, turtle or goose. Um, if you were looking at your goosing dog from the side, your turtling dog from the side, the head won't be at 11 o'clock. Okay. Camping, you think about it. How can you reach out without reaching down? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this, it, this is just normally relaxed. This is 11 o'clock. There is, this is a very important angle. This is the angle where the neck rises out of the shoulders. And the muscling of the neck is a very important part of how uh, force and energy is moved around the body. And so that the neck be co correctly attached to the body is important. Your necks are very common in collies. And your neck, this would be shaped more like that. And the angle here would be much sharper, it would come up like this. The head would be more flat out that way, and there would be a bulge on the underside of the neck. You, there's more or less degrees of that. It's a weakness. It does not work as efficiently. Dogs with your necks cannot jump properly, and they can swim where, uh, with their heads at the right angle. And uh, they will not carry their heads properly when they move. Uh, all right, here's our short back. Notice that the loin arch, it becomes harder and harder to see as you add flesh to the bones. You can feel this. When we have the Lucy later, we're gonna go over her. Uh, you'll be able to feel this. You can't see it as well. Here's the, the beautiful proof line. So the, the whole top line of collie is really pretty. Soft, gentle, curve. Moving on down. Here's our prosternum or forechest sticking out in front of the dog, the way we talked about before. Um, the height of the dog is divided into two equal parts. The uh, half of its height is length of leg. The other half is depth of body. So this measurement from here to here is the same as from here to here. <coughs> the uh, depth of chest is right at the elbow, and it's carried back as far as about the ninth rib. So this stays deep, and then it comes in a general curve into a moderate tuck up. Right, so I have also drawn angles on this. When you're looking at dogs in the ring or on the ground, the, uh, if the uh, top line looks like this, and then you just drop your eye down and look where the feet hit the ground, and if they're hitting the ground at 90 degrees, it means that that dog has, is standing in a balanced way. It's the way the standard tells us that we want to show the breed, which is standing, it's called standing four square. It's balanced, the feet are the correct distance apart, the toes are posing, pointing forward. Now we're dropping another line from the point of the buttocks to the ground, and notice that that line bisects the rear toes. This is, a collie stands with his rear feet slightly behind him, not under him. Back feet are not over here. They're, and they're not like the German Shepherd, where, which is, uh, the German Shepherds are intentionally bred with the uh, hind legs too long, longer than the front. So German Shepherds would be back here. So it's a, it's a much more moderately constructed structure. This right angle lines up with the elbows and withers as you go up the dog. It's a really quick snapshot. You can tell if the dog is balanced, if the legs are the right length. If the legs weren't the right length, they could even stand like that. If uh, there's a weakness somewhere in a hock, the They'll bring them try to put at least one foot under them. So if the dog is standing like this, it's, it's got a good essential body balance. This is that same thing from the front. Now look at how nicely, this is where the prosternum is, and this is where the neck, you can see the neck muscles and how they, all the muscles flow into the shoulders. And this graceful connection and the strength of it is going to help the dog move effortlessly and have a tremendous amount to do with the general athleticism. And that balance that we were talking about, you need a balance of bone, and you only get a balance of bone <coughs> if the dog has the right angles, front and rear, to give you the right muscle. Now, if, the, if the front placement is off, the other thing is that the prosternum can be too high or too low, which is going to impact the strength of this muscle connection for the neck. Um, Muscling, the um, degree of muscling for front and back should be similar. 
it's the, uh, these legs are supposed to work together. And the inside, the muscle on the inside of the leg and the outside of the leg should be of the same size and tone for that leg to move straight. If one is, uh, if the muscle on one side or the other is stronger and more well developed, the dog is going to uh, pull to the other side. That muscle is going to pull the bone in, uh, the strong muscle will pull the bone in its direction so that the, cop, the dog will either move wide or cap up. And you should always check your dogs occasionally. Just run down their little thighs and make sure that you're feeling good firm muscle. And if you're not, you're finding more on one side of the dog's leg than the other dog's leg, then there could be an injury there. <coughs> <coughs> or too much time on the couch. <laughs> Which is an injury. <laughs> get him off the couch and get him on the road. <coughs> Excuse me, just too <coughs> Okay, this dog obviously is not proportioned to, it looks more like a Great Dane, but for your visualization pleasure. Right, this is a instruction on how to determine the degree of leg of the shoulder which is a concept that a lot of people don't understand where to measure it. And also, nobody, there are a lot of, lots of disagreement on what angle is correct. To measure it, we take this, our group down the center of the shoulder blade, and we draw an extent, an imaginary line that goes right through that. These are three imaginary lines, the purple lines. And then we draw a vertical line straight to the ground. And this is where the angle is measured. It's not, a lot of people think that the, when, they, when we talk about laying the back of shoulder angle, they mean this one here. That's not what we're talking about. It is this one. Uh, for years, everybody said a college should have a 45 degree laid back of shoulder. And the laid back of shoulder has to do with the angle of the, this angle more than anything else. And actually, here's our little prosternum that we've been talking about right there. So in a total, in a 45 degree mm -hmm. angle, the shoulder slope is so high that it totally obscures the uh, prosternum. You can't, the prosternum is in behind this bone, which means that the dog can't rotate that shoulder as well as it can if it's behind it. So you find most collies are closer to this third degree angle here. This is a uh, partially a, a heritage that from the sight hound, which we have behind the collies, uh, some now extinct coated sight hound back in the mid 19th century was crossed into the sheep dogs. And we got a lot of benefits from that outcross. A lot of it was a lot of the beautiful, graceful soft lines that we have in the dog, uh, the arch and the loin, and a more open shoulder. And the fact that when a collie is in full, flat, dead run, they can extend and tuck much more than a lot of breeds can. <coughs> so our, our measuring the layback shoulder is this angle here. It's all imaginary. You don't actually use the dog's actual bones to measure it. This is Lorraine Stills center of gravity diagrams. Dogs like the collie, have uh, rear wheel drive. Uh, pushing is much more efficient way to move anything than pulling. If you, uh, back in the early days of civilization when they just developed a horse collar, which enabled a horse to push a load by pushing into the collar rather than pulling it, they increased the ability of the animal to pull weight exponentially. It's very, very much more efficient. So our assembly is a, uh, this is our drive and power, and this is a uh, landing gear and steering gear. Now what do you think would happen, we've talked about balance, if you've got too much in the back for the front? Well, what happens if you have too much in the front for the back? You have to have the balance. Uh, yeah, there's some, uh, we've got a, a, a book that I'm going to mention briefly later, which has some spectacular crashes in it, which is what happens when uh, the, the, the over-angulated dog in rear 
over jumps his uh, small friend and ends up in his chin. It's not cool. All right, this is the first of our real dogs. Uh, we selected a, uh, this is an adolescent, uh, mid, like nine, 12 puppy. Because it's the closest that we could find to the diagrams and that his muscling and uh, the coat is immature. So you can actually see some of the things. You can see the uh, angulations of shoulder. You can see this one. There's a stifle. Uh -huh. You can see his neck, the uh, little rise over the uh, withers. You can't see anymore that rise over the loin is disappearing, but you can't feel it. Here's this chest to the elbow, carries the, with the depth of chest carries back into the moderate tuck up. Now when you're kicking the dog, <coughs> yep. talking about the, the um, length of loin, um, when you're feeling, <coughs> and, and you've got your hands yep. on both sides of the loin, and I know it's a little, it'll be a little bit different to the size of Tommy, but what would you expect to feel from the last rib, that last little rib, to where you feel the point of the hip? What are you talking about? Then a hand's breadth, just the fingers, or what? Well, are you talking about the length of it or the width? The length. The, I mean, when you put your hands. All right. Oh. Looking at, we're looking at the uh, from you the dog on the, the loin is here, and so there's your ribs. And so that's where it is. Yeah. Uh, I feel loin by getting behind the dog. Right. And find you, 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 you're standing behind the dog, so there, dog's facing you. You're putting your hands both sides of the back, and you're just feeling down until you find the end of the rib. Right. And then I want this, my whole handful. Okay. There's a roll of muscle right. that comes across. You'll see, when we, Bring the dog out. You're going to right. feel it. Uh, she's got a really nice little muscle. We have another question. Uh, yeah. Well, I yeah. think what she's trying to ask. <clears throat> in smaller breeds, you can do this. I don't know if you can do it in collies, but a lot of times in smaller breeds, such as a corgi, they say you should only feel three finger lengths from that back rib to that, that hip joint. So I think what she's saying, what you're asking, should you feel a full hand's length right. what, what, from uh, that last what would you rib? Expect I don't think you feel. can do oh, that. Oh, oh, okay. When you talk about like uh, you okay. have to put that in proportion to the dog, right? right. Because it's because one third and it's long. It, I'd much rather look at it in in what percentage of the dog's length it is than uh, what percentage of my length it is. I I, I was initially taught well, tr it should be hands breath, the whole hand. But the person who taught me that was a big guy, and I have really small hands. Right. And so I put my finger on my first dog. Oh my god. You're long and long. No, he wasn't long and long. My hands are too small. I think the proportion is it will do better for you. Okay. I know it. And when you're picking a dog, you know, he's a young dog. Look at your puppies at eight weeks. What the puppy is at eight weeks. Structurally, he should be as an adult. Nine weeks is not a good time. Ten weeks, because if you have that teenage puppy that looks like he's got more legs than body, and grow funny. That's the way it is. So look at that eight-week-old puppy. He has it then, and the puppy has unrestricted exercise. The muscle can develop. There is a door of opportunity that if that muscle isn't developed, you can't go back. So you've got to do it. Do it young. Here's the same dog, uh, older. And you can see here, this is that, uh, that famous Prosternum poor chest area, and you can see how the uh, the muscle in the neck is rising out of the shoulder here. And there's another thing on him uh, that this photograph is standing on a rock. Uh, puppies can sometimes be cocky because their legs, when, especially in, not when they're tiny, but when they are adolescents, different parts of the body grow at different rates. And he was at nine months in the first photograph, slightly cocky. You, you don't want this to be any more than the hawk to ground measurement to be any more than a third of the height at rear. And puppies will very often get very high there for a while and then uh, the rest of the leg will grow. And 
he was, and he sort of straightened out. Now we're going to move from smooth to rough. This bitch, so running over the same thing. There's the neck, the withers, the short back, slope of croup. Here's the shoulder. You can see the shoulder, the elbow here is right under the wither. You see the forechest is out in front of the dog, that her ears line is in front of her. All the same things we talked about on the charts. Uh, it's because she's a tri, the chest depth is a little hard to see on the picture. And because she's rough, it's a very pleasing outline. Where is this bitch? This funny story, I tried to borrow this bitch because one of the things for the seminar that we wanted was photographs like this. Same dog standing and moving, and then to have the dog here so you could see it. And we actually found it was very difficult. And this bitch, I had arranged to borrow her. I, I talked to the handler and at the Connecticut Special Days, and then checked in with her a couple of times. And they said, well, we're going to breed her. So I <coughs> bit my fingernails and then uh, heard, oh, no, she's not pregnant. OK. They started to advertise her to go to the National. And a couple of days before they were to leave, they went out into the kennel, and there was this funny noise. And they thought somebody had a rabbit. And they look into the pen, and she had two puppies. They had x-rayed her, they ultrasounded, no vet found them, she just had two puppies. So congratulations to Darcy, and I'm sorry she's not here. But you needed to know that. But that's why we really did our best to get her here. Now what's neat about this photo is if you look, you have the rise over the withers, you have the nice croup, but then you have, you know, the hair is swaying, you have a level top line. That mm -hmm. level top line is when they move. That mm -hmm. is beautiful. Now let's talk about the bio biomechanics. What happens to her between standing and moving? Here she is with 60% of her weight over her forelegs, 40 over the back. Now, actually, that's not a very efficient uh, way to be moving in a rear wheel drive. Rear wheel drive, you want weight over your drive wheels. And the animal actually moves the weight. So here we have her neck at 11 o'clock. Here it drops to 10 o'clock. This is one of the reasons that necks are so important. The neck drops to 10 o'clock, and this whole area, now think of this three dimensionally, not two dimensionally, but the whole neck now <coughs> is transmitting force back. <coughs> through the abdominal muscles of the dog, through the muscles along the top of the back, but they're not major here. The major strength muscles are the ones on the bottom and the sides of the abdomen. And that's all being transmitted back. So that as she is in this balanced trot, balance being a key word, remember, in bodies, her weight is now 50-50 over the legs. She's moved a bunch of it back to give herself traction. A couple of other things about her here. In this position, the farthest forward her front paw can reach is under her chin. Under here. Say that one more time. The, far, the maximum distance forward that a dog's foreleg can move is under the end of the nose. You're not always going to see it. It depends how fast the dog is going. If the dog is doing a simple jog trot, very slowly moving, you're, you're not going to see the full extension. But in a full extended trot, that's as far as it can go. It cannot go out here. And that same leg as it comes back, all right, right here is our vertical line from the other diagram, imaginary line. As the leg comes back, it goes through the vertical and actually comes back by that ninth rib. The, it follows the widest point of the chest all the way back here in a graceful follow through. If any of you have min pins or seen them, Min pin moves in a stilted, what we call hackney gait. And one of the things that happens when the dog moves, as that foreleg comes down to the vertical, it stops dead. It doesn't do the follow through. So you get a, a, you can see the jolt as it stops dead and then comes back up as kind of a goose step. And we don't want a herding dog to move like that. It's very, it's too much shock on the body. It's very inefficient. So what so, you're looking for, think of the collie movement as a water wheel. That's just one flowing. flowing movement. And think of the movement that you don't want of that min pin as a screen door. Close, open. Close, open. Okay, in the rear, 
the uh, rear leg also comes forward into this widest part of the chest and then it moves back. Well, here's our, our back line from the other diagram. So it's well behind the dog. And if you were standing behind her, you would be able to see the toes of her rear feet as the, as the leg goes back. But also notice, and this is very correct for colleagues, that the, there's not a lot of clearance of the, of the foot off the ground. Because that's not efficient. They, uh, they, they, don't, uh, they don't lift the foot any farther up than they have to. And it's effortless. Let's look at her face. She's just relaxed. She can do this all day, which is what, exactly what we want. These diagrams show the dynamic balance of the dog in motion. Sometimes hard to see this when they're moving because they're going too fast. This is the um, center line, the vertical line, uh, front and rear. And notice that the, uh, the foot is coming down. I'm going to look at the assembly as a whole assembly, not just the foot. It's not just that the foot is tracking close to the center line. But it's the whole shoulder assembly and it has a straight line that comes down at a slant on both sides of this kind of a V shape. And that's the same in the rear. Here's the whole rear assembly from the hip all the way down to the foot. Straight lines. Like the whole assembly is being used together. It's not a bunch of little separate parts. Same side, same on the other side. So you, again, you get the V as the dog goes away. Notice you can see the bottoms of the feet. And it's effortless. Think about when you run. When you run, you're running one foot in front of the other. Now, if the dog couldn't do that, how, how fast am I going to be if I'm doing this? You're not going to get that same kind of movement. So you want that to converge into the center. One of the other main reasons for this, this is called single tracking. And that's in standard, where the feet, the faster the dog goes, the more the feet converge on the center line of the dog. And this gives you, it, this is a profile like a bicycle, like a person riding a bicycle. And with the way this is, dog is moving, by the ever so slightly, they are leaning in and out of the curves. And by just leaning a little bit, they can use their whole body weight to change direction instantaneously. And it's very strong. I've got pictures that are coming up later in this presentation that will uh, show the dog actually doing this. But when you're looking at the dogs moving in the classes in the next few days, look for this V of movement. If the dog is moving, particularly if they, the uh, CC of A tends to have a good big ring, you can see them stretch out a little bit. In a small ring, in a you know, country show, there may not be enough room to, for the dog to get this full uh, single track and action going. <coughs> I don't want to talk a lot about thoughts, but these are misconceptions about movement. People might think it's right, it's not. This dog, there's nothing wrong with the way he's moving, it's just not single tracking. And not all breeds do. Collies do, a lot of them don't. This dog's legs are going parallel lines, not converging toward a single center line. This dog is all over the place. The problem with him, notice that this assembly is one straight line, that the muscles of the dog are holding the bone into a stiff straight alignment and using that leg is one unit rather than a bunch of them. In this dog, each angle is separate. It's not using its leg as a single assembly. It's therefore weaker, and it's not absorbing shock. It's not as efficient. It's and it's not efficient. Right, the transfer from where she was pointing her pointer from here to here she stops. It's got to relate it in to the hock and then down to the foot. So you're losing, you're wasting energy, you're wasting motion. And here's a, uh, just a nice simple dog coming at you at a relaxed trot. No uh, problems. But we didn't talk earlier, I should have, sorry, about elbows. When the dog is coming at you or standing still, you shouldn't see him. There's a little niche there, they, they tuck in close to the body, and the same is true with the knees. You, you don't want any of that to be visible. Notice that this dog is trotting in a completely straight line. He's not throwing his rear out to one way or the other. And his head angle, even from the front, you can tell, is 
he's carrying it in a nice, comfortable tent cloth. And you could probably go ahead and do that all day. Here are three different body, we, not all colleagues are alike. There are different ones. We have variation in the standard in size. We, they can be so many inches and so many pounds. And we have lithe and strong and active and responsive and difficult. we're gonna interpret those words in relation <coughs> to each other slightly differently. That's part of the art of reading color. So these are different. This dog is big, strong boy. This one, young female, totally different families. Uh, this photograph is interesting in that the way the light hit the, you can see the spring roof and see how it's not a big round thing. It's just, it's a gentle oval. But when you're, and you'll see this on, uh, on Lucy, the Lucy Smith that we're going to show you later. When, when you come off the spine, it just, there's a definite roundness. And then you can see how her ribcage angles in to make that space for her elbow and her whole foreleg assembly to come by without hitting it. So it moves in a very easy way. This is one of our favorite fish. This is a little tiny puppy. He's an eight week old puppy who has just, as the camera caught her, she has picked up the dumbbell and, and done a quick pivot turn and is sprinting back to mark. <clears throat> and as Pat said earlier, if you, if our eye tried that, we'd fall flat on our face. We'd be flat on our face. Look at her feet and where they are. <laughs> Can you even count them? But here is a real key. Where's that tail? What's it doing? It is in total balance. It is in control of where that dog is moving. The tail is just as important as that sternum in the front. Front to rear, total balance. This puppy has it. This is another uh, just, a, just dog in the shower and moving very nicely with good balance all over. You can see. Oops, I'm not doing it on that all these lines are, just to say we're in the standing still, nice long strides. And note, remember about seeing the pads? Right there, yeah. right there. But not, the foot's not lifted up too high? Not exaggerated. <clears throat> sometimes it's difficult when they, to watch a move, moving dogs, because they're going too fast, to see some of the detail. But collies should have a long stride. It's one of the differences between them and some of the other herding breeds. And they sh it shouldn't look, if you put a, a collie and a dog like a Belgian sheepdog and had them trot the same distance in the same time, the Belgian would take more steps because it has a short step. I was at a show recently sitting at ringside and there were three women there and three collies came into the ring and they came in at three different gates and they went, isn't that beautiful? And I'm thinking to myself, no, it isn't. Because we had one that was hackneyed. We had one that was overreaching and choppy, and another one that was just rolling from side to side. And it wasn't because she was fat, and it wasn't because she was a puppy. It's because she had no place to put her feet. But they were really moving fast does not make good movement. This is a wonderful picture. This is a veteran. Mm -hmm. Old bitch. You should all be going, oh. This is, we do. We, uh, it's actually very hard to work on these presentations because we keep blubbering because the dogs are so beautiful so that you get the, the popcorn's all wet. <laughs> but we can look at her. She is holding together beautifully. This, the whole uh, top line, Beautiful neck. There's that little arch there. Uh, you can see in this photograph the muscle tension that is holding that whole front assembly is one piece, and the one that's holding the whole rear assembly is one piece. She said the full extension. There's the nose. There's the foot. And you know she's like 10 years old. You know, we will always want our old dogs to be able to do that. You. That's just in your mind. That's what we're here for. Is to improve the dog's quality of life through their whole life. And if you look at her mom, her mom is going, oh my gosh, can I keep up with her? <laughs> That's what you want. A couple more. 
versions of the sun can, you can the uh, little triters at the bottom is not going as fast as the same boy at the top. But it looks a little different. And no more. Okay, this is the very first dog we showed you, the one that was the, the teenage puppy. And so that's what his structure translates into. And I like this picture because of the view. You can see what the chest does. It's, you know, with the, the camera can capture the feet in different positions. And this one, you can see, there's is the shoulder. And then you can see this prosternum area right across here. And what it's doing, and how the neck comes out, and again, how the legs are, the strides are the same length, the tail is the rudder, and everything in balance. He can obviously do this all day. We shouldn't uh, not tolerate severe structural faults, which impede his function as a working dog. It's kind of time to look at the collie as a working dog for a minute and see how the dog is using its body. Now, a quick look at that. That's a beautiful picture. Beautiful, beautiful. Look at the tucker. Mm -hmm. Look at where the head is. If you don't have a sternum in the correct place and the musculature there, that dog is not going to be there. She's doing this in a very relaxed way. You know, here I am, just flying through the air. Mm -hmm. It takes a very good structure to be able to bend the body. Yeah. Two more dogs jumping. This is uh, different places in the jump than the other one. This one is uh, just taking off. You see the tuck up in the front. And I like it, what I like about this picture is the way he's using his neck and the way that how his whole neck assembly here is kind of, again, it's a one piece. He's not uh, using the different parts of his body separately. Right, they're working in concert. And when you look at this dog coming over the jump, he's coming over with grace and ease. It's my first obedience dog. I learned a lot about structure and a lot about needing to learn about structure for him. He was a very obedient dog and would do anything I asked him to, except he had a problem with the high jump. Broad jump was easy. High jump, he would run to it, he would stop, and then just try to jump over it. Took him to the vet, what's wrong with him? The vet couldn't find anything wrong. Well, what did he know? He knew bones. We saw it in slow motion. As the dog came down, he would hit his chin into the floor because there was no flexibility in the shoulders. So he was running because mom said to run. He came to the jump and went, okay, I'm gonna do it, knowing he was gonna hit his chin. I pulled him from obedience. That was it, it was a lesson to me. As a breeder, you owe it to everybody that you sell a puppy to, that it will be able to jump over the fence with the kids or pick up a dumbbell. These are, these are fun. This is a uh, little bitch hurting. But you can see how she's using her body. Here, we have that, that front assembly, again, is a one piece. She's actually got her whole weight on one leg in a tight turn. Notice the tail as both rudder and counterweight. And the way she's leaning into the, into the turn, which because her, this leg was right, here's that center line. She actually had that foot in weight at the center line, so she was ready to lean into it. She could have easily, as easily gone the other direction if the sheep had bolted that way. And then this one, look what she's doing in the rear. She's lifting herself with her rear, flexing this loin area, bending it to switch her body to the, to the left after the sheep. And when you're talking about balance, look at the structure. I'm talking about balance, look at the expression on that bitch. Is she serious? Yes. Is she having a good time? You better believe it. Is that what she was bred for? Yes. Our responsibility. All right. This one, um, this is the Aflac shot. Yep. This is the <laughs> Dutch <Rumble. laughs> Can't wait. Can't wait. This just gives you an idea of, of, of the body stretching out. He actually, the camera has not quite fully extended. 
the body can stretch out. And also in the Sinai heritage, when it comes into the top part of that, when it really runs, the body can fold so that the feet come real close together at a full open run. And look at, that is a beautiful collie. We're talking about balance of body, balance of mind, balance of soul, and look at the face. One. And she is, is choosing how she's using her body, sort of cakewalk. Well, mm -hmm. And then they're, they sometimes have to hurt other things. <laughs> A tennis ball in this case. For how long? This dog uh, lived to be over 13, and he was doing this the day before he died. Mm -hmm. That's what you want. Uh, well balanced body is not going to have a chance, and with all the right proportions, the correct muscling is not going to get breakdown with arthritis. It's six or seven years old. They're going to last, and they're going to be able to do stuff well into their early teens, which is the objective of good bodies in a breeding program. It makes your mothers have puppies easier. It's just natural. Right, before we bring the get the actual dog, I want to uh, share a book with you. And we've got a bunch here that you can come and look at. This is a new one that we were issued to oh, evaluate. Right. We're going to be out in the house. I found it's really great. And this is especially true of performance people who don't get puppies that often. Performance people need to know more about, as much or more about confirmation than, than breeder, and they need to be just as picky or more so than anybody's going to show in the confirmation ring. Uh, there are very, very few faults in a dog that the performance person who's going to run a dog in agility is going to be able to live with. We got to get going. Okay. The, uh, but this book is great. It breaks down each physical characteristic of the dog into little, and that tells you the consequences for each sport if the dog has a fault in that area. And okay, we can, do this. Yes. Well, structure and action. we can do this. In order to evaluate a dog's structure, so you need to be able to find them on a real dog. It's easy to do it on the chart. Some of them are harder on a yeah. real dog. And we're going to look at this. Uh, let's see what I'm doing here. Here's your these two angulations. There's the withers up here, point of shoulder, elbow. And that was one set. And then we have. Uh, the rear, and it's interesting, there's an easy test for the rear angulation. As you pick up the dog's foot, last time I did this, she tried to lean on me. And you lift it all the way up to the box here. And notice that the foot bends right down to the ground, and that this comes easily with no resistance up here. Could you do this again? Sure. Like that. Okay. Okay. That's a, just, that's a quick and easy way to do that if you don't want to measure it. Here, I'd like you to, to uh, run your hands down her neck, front and aft, and feel this connection between the, uh, the neck and the withers and this lovely soft angle that she's got here. And also that the neck is nice and straight and flat here and the way it comes up out of this prosternum. Her prosternum is going to be very easy for you to feel because it's got a very nice placement. So you can feel all that stuff. Uh, another quick test for you, Nick. Let me just hold for a second. You should bend the head up. It should come without resistance, just gently lifting the head. It shouldn't come up any further than this. You don't want to, unless you're dealing with that new breed, that funny Icelandic cliff climbing dog, I can't remember the name of it, which is double jointed and whose head will actually come way back here. That's it. If you get no resistance. Okay, why doesn't everybody come up and just go, oh, loin. We were talking about mm, right. feeling loins and arch of loin. I like to do loin from the back. You just come down here and you find the end of the rib. And, all right, here is her. Her withers are here. Her ribs end around here. And the loin is like that. So it is one third of this whole space. It is bigger than my hand. But I got really small hands. I think that's uh, trying to look at the portion is more accurate. And she is a girl, 
So I'm going to take, I would, if you were a boy, I'd want this line a little shorter. Okay, one at a time, or one on each side, come and feel her. And if you can't find something, ask and we'll show you where it is. And if we were going to have one more, everybody get together, everybody is gone. Oh. <laughs> Why do you want the loin shorter for a boy? Um, just a little. It, uh, it's not. Puppies. It's not that I want to shorter for a boy. It's that I'll accept it longer for a girl. Uh -huh. because, of because of the, the, of the puppies. Yeah. Right. So it's not. It, this is. It's, so it's functional. It's right. Not yeah, the, the standard oh. doesn't break it down by gender. But I think just most of us would accept a little more length of loin in a in a girl. You get much too much, it's going to be weak and you can feel it. And usually dogs that have a really long line don't have a particularly strong rear assembly, so that the rear assembly on her, which is nice, it's you know a nice percentage of her total length is the rear and the angulation. If this leg were straight instead of the, the nice curves that it has, right. it would take up less space this way. So this is supposed to, the line here is supposed to come right straight, no, it's supposed to come all right, if you were dropping an imaginary line here and she were standing fully four square, which is not, it should go like this. Okay. And so this should be 90 this, degrees. This is 90 degrees. Yeah. If this is 90 degrees, if the leg is the correct line, then a vertical drop on the stairs is twice.